Good morning, everybody. I'd like to invite you to find your seats and we'll stand together and sing. The first song we're going to sing will be on the projector behind us, but you can also find it in your hymn book. Hymn 18, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. Welcome to Coromdale Baptist Church this morning. You may be seated. Just like to begin with announcements before our call to worship. Um, as always, Wednesday prayer meeting is at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. So we welcome you all to that. Today we have a members meeting after the service. Should be a short meeting, but... Um, if you brought uh, a bag lunch or something, you can eat while we meet, and uh, that will be a good time for the members. Um, just want to draw your attention now this morning to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. A Psalm of David. Now quiet your hearts as we listen to the word of God. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. 
You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come this morning to offer to you thanksgiving and praise. Lord, we bow towards your holy temple. Lord, indeed, you are enthroned above the heavens. Heaven of heaven can't contain you. Lord, you're exalted. You've exalted above all things your name and your word. God, in your steadfast love and faithfulness, endure forever. Lord, we come to you this morning as the God who never changes. Lord, and we, we know that we do change. Lord, we see change and decay all around. Lord, and we see the sinfulness, the fluctuations of our own hearts. God, we see the change in our circumstances and troubles around us. Lord, but we want to come before you this morning and quiet our hearts and know who you are. Be still and know that you are God. Lord, we ask that you would also help us just for a moment as we search our hearts. God, convict us, show us things that we need to see to prepare our hearts for worship. Lord, we know that on our own, God, we are a sinful and wretched people, God, that we are selfish and proud and unbelieving at the root, Lord, in the very core of our being, out of our hearts, not any external thing that makes us unclean, but our own hearts, Lord. These are, th this is where these things, all immorality and idolatry and injustice and evil ways come from lord but we look to our redeemer lord and those of us who know your redeeming love lord you've transformed our hearts god you've given us new hearts we're living a new life we're dead to sin and we're alive to you lord and you've washed away every sin stain lord past present and future you forgive all of our iniquities god and so we thank you this morning for jesus christ we thank you for the new exodus we thank you for a greater deliverance from sin and slavery to it from satan's tyranny god we thank you for the cross and your resurrection oh god and we praise you that you are the one now seated in heaven crowned with glory and honor God, we pray that we would worship you aright this morning, that you would tune our hearts to sing your praise, that we would worship in reverence and awe and see your holiness, your kingship, and all your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue on in worship. Please stand with me. <clears throat> you can turn to hymn 48 in your hymnal. Holy, holy, holy. Adore thee, 
casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Who 
else invites me to call him Father, only a holy God, only my holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only Christ. the holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Turn to him 135, or oh, worship the king. Oh, worship the king, all glorious above. And gratefully sing his wonderful love Our shield and defender, the ancient of days Pavilion in splendor and girded with praise Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? The breeze in the air, it shines in the light. It sings through the hills, it descends to the plain. The sweet lady stills and the dew and the rain. For children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. In hymn number two, praise to the Lord Almighty. the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my health and salvation. All you hear now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. To the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, he so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires all have been? Granted in what he ordained. 
Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he befriend thee. Praise to the Lord who let all that is in me adore him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Let me forever adore him. Let the Amen. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly forever adore him. Thank you. you may be seated. Scripture reading today is Revelation 4, starting at verse 1, and through to the end of chapter 5. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seat seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Car Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning torches, were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Then I saw in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, 
Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and every people and nation. And you have made a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Go to the Lord in prayer once more. <clears throat> oh Lord God, we come this morning to worship you, the Holy, Holy, Holy One, the Lord of hosts, Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. Lord, you're the one who was and is and is to come. And you are worthy, Lord, of all glory and power and honor and blessing and might, Lord, and we thank you for your work coming to this earth, dying on our behalf. Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and glory and honor and blessing and all these gifts that we can bring. Lord, because you have redeemed a people for yourself from every tribe, language, and nation. God, who will worship you forever around your throne. <clears throat> God, we thank you for the great work that you're doing in salvation history, Lord, in all the earth, Lord, that you have chosen before all ages a people for yourself. You have called them in due time and redeemed them by your blood. You've sealed them with your Holy Spirit for an eternal inheritance that we will enjoy forever. Lord, your presence with us forever. God, and that we should be included in this eternal plan. Lord, we cry out, why us, Lord? Why were we invited to the feast? Lord, but we thank you and praise you because we know that it's nothing about us, not because of our own righteousness, Lord, yet only because of your free love and grace that you've lavished upon us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that that would be our motivation in all of life, Lord, that that would encourage us, that the love of Christ would compel us, Lord, to live for you, not for our own sake, but for the one who, for our sake, died and was raised. Lord, we are new creations. Help us to see ourselves that way and turn away from the things of this world that are passing away, Lord, to truly enter your kingdom. Lord, indeed, as you've said, we have to become like little children to enter your kingdom. It's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom. Lord, we need to deny self and follow you, taking up our cross. Lord, and it does mean suffering. It means opposition. It means a cost, Lord, in this present age. And yet, Lord, you attend to us even in this age such blessings Lord, that we get to be a part of the people of God, and so our family is multiplied a hundredfold. Lord, we possess all things in you. Lord, an eternal life we have from you. So, Lord, even if we have to go through trials and sufferings in this present evil age, God, help us to resolve to follow you. God, we pray that you would keep our confidence firm to the end. Lord, bless each one here, Lord, I ask by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would walk in the new life, that we would grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, that Christ would be formed in our church. Lord, that we would give glory to you. And Lord, worship your holy name and be a holy people. Lord, we ask that you would empower us, Lord, for our mission on this earth to bring the gospel, to preach the gospel, to spread it 
from sea to sea, Lord, and to the, from the river to the ends of the earth, Lord, that you would have dominion. Lord, your kingship would spread over all the earth as you redeem people from all nations. Lord, we do pray for those um, missionaries that we've heard of and supported even to a little degree, Lord, in the past. God, we pray that you would encourage them, Lord, especially Blaine, Lord, that you give him more open doors for the gospel. Encourage him, help him not to grow weary in well-doing. Lord, and we pray you would provide for all his needs. God, and we do ask that you would provide for us, that we would be able to support others as well. God, and support more abundantly those who go out into the field. Lord, we pray for laborers for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Lord, we pray earnestly, Lord, asking that you would raise up people, more people from our midst, even this local church, God. We ask that you would raise up men and women who would take your gospel to new frontiers, Lord, and old frontiers that are becoming new frontiers. Lord, we recognize that many people in our own city have never heard the gospel. So God, we pray that you would send out workers in all these fields. God, we pray for our governing leaders and ask that you would humble their hearts, Lord, that they would seek after you. Lord, even as the psalm said, all the kings of the earth will glorify you. They'll praise you. They'll sing of your ways. Lord, we pray that you would put your praise on their lips, God, and cause them to seek you and seek humility and seek righteousness. God, we thank you. We rejoice for what has happened down in the States, that abortion is no longer a, seen as a constitutional right Lord, but we know it has to go further than that, Lord, that you must change hearts. God, that we would not seek this injustice, Lord, which covers our land. God, we do pray that you would raise up more advocates for the unborn and for women, Lord, that there would be ample support for the women in broken situations, for the men who also are part of this problem. God, we pray that you would keep those in our midst and keep our children from wandering into these broken ways as well. God, we know we're not immune, Lord. We are a sin-prone people. God, but we thank you for organizations like the PCC and pray for them, God, that you'd continue to sustain them and provide for them. Lord, and encourage every worker there that they would keep doing that good work. God, we pray for those who are suffering as well in our congregation and ask for your healing hand upon them. Lord, and ask especially that you would give comfort and endurance and grow character, Lord, as we endure many things. Lord, we do pray also for the persecuted church. God, we know that there are many countries where persecution is fierce and severe. Lord, we think of places like Afghanistan and Eritrea and North Korea, of India, Turkey. God, we ask that you would sustain those who are in prison, who are being hated and persecuted even to death. Lord, help them to maintain the faith and their confidence in you, knowing that their reward in heaven is very great, Lord. You are the pearl of great price. You are the treasure hidden in the field. Lord, help us to give up all to follow you, knowing that heaven is worth far more than anything upon this earth. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and guide us and sanctify us by your truth. In this hour, as I preach your word, God, we ask for your power to change our hearts and renew us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn to Joshua chapter 5. <clears throat> and as we turn there, sheets are being handed out, especially for the children, but anyone who likes to have a sheet to focus while the sermon goes on. 
and would just remind all of you that there are rooms for um, child care um, outside the sanctuary and you can make uh, use of those but we also love to have children in our midst and we don't mind the the few cries and squawks that happen <laughs> every now and then so <clears throat> All right, Joshua chapter 5, we'll start in verse 13. <clears throat> when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, in the Canadian military, as is true around the world in military operations, there are very clearly defined ranks in a hierarchical structure, right? You have to know your place. You have to know where your orders come from. And this is essential for the passing of orders during operations. It's essential for ensuring clarity of command and also for maintaining order and discipline within the army. If there's no understanding of who is above you and below you and whose orders you follow, the whole operation will inevitably fall apart. Of course, there are rare stories of heroes who disobeyed commands and then did something great and heroic and were honored later. But that's a rare exception. And especially as we're talking about matters of God and his kingdom and his mission, we need to especially understand rank. And I think this is the lesson that Joshua learns in this passage. We could say this passage is really summed up with the question, who's really in command? Who's really in command? That's the question Joshua had to ask and answer. There are three points I want to share here in this passage. First, the commander's identity. Second, the commander's loyalty. And third, the commander's servant. First of all, the commander's identity. This little section invites us into this sort of mysterious encounter that Joshua had while near Jericho, the first city that Israel was to conquer. They'd come out of the wilderness, of course. They were now enjoying the fruit of the land of Canaan. And Joshua was near Jericho and Probably he was looking at this great fortified city with an inner wall and an outer wall, and he was thinking and perhaps praying, plotting, how are we going to take over this great city of Jericho? He was asking for wisdom, probably, from God in this daunting circumstance near Jericho. And you see in chapter 6 that God does give direction to Joshua and then leads them to victory. But first, he has this encounter which solidifies a certain lesson in Joshua's mind and heart. We read, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. Out of nowhere, there's a man standing before Joshua, sword drawn, ready for battle. Naturally, Joshua wants to come up to him and ask whose side he's on. Are you for us or for our adversaries? You look ready to fight. Are you ready to join our army? Or have you come from the enemy side? 
It's important to know, of course, what side people are on in war. This is why we have distinct uniforms and helmets and insignia and all these things, to identify whose side people are on. But this man, we see, does not fit into either category so neatly. He answers the question in a strange way. Well, Joshua expected either for you or for Canaan or for Jericho, the man simply replies, no. You can't fit me into your boxes so neatly, in other words. Not simply for Israel or for Jericho. Rather, he says, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, who is this figure here, this mysterious person who appears out of nowhere? He says he's the commander of the army of the Lord. He's a commander. He's a leader. He's an official of the army or host, you could translate that word there, of the Lord, of Yahweh, the God of Israel. So what does he mean here? Well, we read of hosts in the Old Testament, sometimes referring to the heavenly host, that is, heavenly beings, angels, that the Lord is in control of. So this is the commander of the heavenly armies of God. But we also read of Israel, sometimes being called the host of Yahweh. Yahweh's army, indeed they were the army here, going into the land of Canaan to defeat those peoples. And so this commander, I believe, is both the commander of God's host in heaven and on earth, the host of Yahweh, that eternal God who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. And so who is this mysterious character? Joshua, we have to remind ourselves as he approached this commander, was already in a sense the commander of the host of Yahweh, wasn't he? He was a leader in Israel. He was tasked with going into this land, leading the people in battle. But now he encounters one who says he is the commander of the hosts of Yahweh. But he says here, now I have come. Now I have come. Saying, in effect, that he had already been anticipated before this. Indeed, if we look back even to Exodus chapter 33, verse 2, which I happened to preach on a while ago, God said that he would send an angel before them to drive out the Canaanites. And we know that was because the people had sinned. They made that golden calf. God's anger was burning against them. And he says, my presence will not go with you. If I go with you for one moment, you'll all be consumed. But he says, I'll send this angel before you to drive out the Canaanites. But we know there, Moses interceded. He asked for God's very presence to be with the people of Israel. Exodus 34, 12, and 15. And God promised that he would go with the people. Yet we see here, I think that both those things were actually fulfilled. He sent an angel in a sense, but he also sent himself. In the Old Testament, there is this character called the angel of the Lord. You've encountered him if you've read passages like Judges 13, where he appears to Samson's parents the angel of the Lord, a mysterious character because it's called an angel of the Lord or messenger of the Lord. That's what that word there means, angel. It can simply mean a messenger, someone sent out by God of the Lord, right? But he also bears the very character and attributes of God, and he speaks as God. He speaks as Yahweh. And so this angel of the Lord is both a messenger from God, but also God himself. And we see this here as well. This commander of the army of the Lord is, I believe, the angel of the Lord, Malach Yahweh. And he is God himself. When he speaks, it is God speaking. So you see in chapter 6, verse 2, the Lord begins to talk to Joshua. And it just continues on from the previous passage. 
And so this is the commander speaking to Joshua, but he is Yahweh, right? We see that in passages like Genesis 18, 1 to 2, the Lord was said to appear before Abraham, but then you see three men appearing to Abraham, but they speak as Yahweh. We see also in this passage that the commander of the army of the Lord receives worship in verse 14. Joshua falls on his face to the earth and worships him. That is not something you do simply to an angel. In fact, at other points, like in Revelation 19.10, John tries to worship an angel, but he says, don't do that. I'm just a fellow servant with you of God. Worship God. But God does receive worship, doesn't he? Our Lord Jesus Christ received worship on earth. Matthew 28.17. We see here also... The commander bears attributes of God, as we'll see more as we go on. He is holy. Verse 15, he tells Joshua to take off his sandals because the place where he was standing was holy. <clears throat> this is exactly what God does when he reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Take off your sandals from your feet for where you're standing. This is holy ground, and it's holy because the holy God is there. So this commander bears the attributes of God. He speaks as God. He receives worship as God does. And so we see the commander is not merely a man. He is a messenger of the Lord, and he is the Lord. Now, that might also be still a bit confusing to us. How can he be sent out from God and yet God? Well, who else do you know who is also sent out from God and yet God himself? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means that this here is a pre-incarnate Christ. An appearance, a theophany of Jesus Christ before he came into the world and took on flesh. But Jesus Christ was sent from the Father, wasn't he? We know our God is three in one. One God in three persons. And the Son is sent out from the bosom of the Father. Of course, Jesus is also our leader and Savior. Isaiah 55, 4 says he's a leader and commander for the peoples. Acts 5.31 says he's leader and savior. Our Lord Jesus Christ is distinct from the Father and yet fully God and sent out from the Father, even at times in the Old Testament, before he came in the flesh. And so this commander, his identity is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ himself. And we see here then the greatness of the person of Jesus Christ. We see that he is the commander of the host of Yahweh. The Father has appointed him in this position of all authority in heaven and on earth. We know Jesus is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He commands heaven's armies and the army of God's kingdom on earth. He's head of the church. He is of highest rank, far above all rule and authority in the heavenly places. Joshua may have been a commander in a sense, but all his orders came from this commander of commanders. If Joshua was general, well, G Jesus was a higher general. As they say in old language, generalissimo. I don't think we use that term anymore. But Jesus is the true leader who must lead his people into battle or else they will fail. Matthew Henry notes here that Christ appeared in this instance as a soldier and commander, which is exactly what Israel needed at this time. And it is so like our God to be to us exactly what we need when we need it. If we need protection, he is our shield. If we need leading, he is our shepherd. 
If we need safety, he is our rock of refuge. If we need comfort, well, he is the God of all comfort. If we need a battle won, he is the commander of the Lord's army, ready, standing there with his sword drawn, ready to fight. It's a beautiful picture we have here of our Lord Jesus Christ, an exalted picture. We see his greatness here. Now, I want to hone in on a couple points as we move on from here, seeing the commander's identity. Now, let's look at the commander's loyalty, honing in on the answer that the commander gives to Joshua when he asks him this question, are you for us or for our adversaries? Jesus, this commander of the army of the Lord, says no, but I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, what is he trying to say there? Well, Joshua assumed this commander would reply either for him or for his enemies. And certainly we do know that God is for his people, right? Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Deuteronomy 1.30, Moses had said, The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. We see the story of David and Goliath, vivid illustration of this. The Philistines were coming against the host of Yahweh, the army of Israel. And David was confident these people must fall because they're coming against the Lord of hosts himself by coming against his people. He said the battle is the Lord's. And he was confident. He went out just with a few stones from the, the brook in a sling against this great giant. And the Lord took him down. God fights for his people. But here, the Lord corrects us a little bit. We see here that God must always maintain his sovereignty, his independence, the freedom of his own will to work for his own purposes. We don't fit God into our box. Rather, we need to come into his box. Sometimes we want to reduce God to our cosmic vending machine. You put in some prayers. You get what you want from him. We want him to fulfill our plans. But this is the God who totally fulfills all of his own purpose to the end who governs the world according to the purpose of his will, according to his eternal counsel. Sometimes we pray to God and expect him to bend to our will, but it is actually prayers according to his will that he hears. 1 John 5, 14. Sometimes we are really aiming for our own glory, even in ministry. But we need to remember, this is the God who does all things for his own glory. All things are from him and through him and to him. To him be the glory forever. Some may think this is selfish of God. Why is God about his own glory, his own praise? Well, think about it. God is the first and best and most glorious of all beings. It's just his right. It's just his due. It's what he deserves. All glory in heaven and on earth. So it is right and just and good for God to be about his own glory. And this indeed has the best effects also on his creation. As God is glorified, he also works for the good of his people. God's loyalty is first and foremost to himself. His own plans, his own purposes, his own principles, not to us or anyone else. He is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Commander of Commanders. You know, maybe sometimes you've been as a kid picking teams for a basketball game or something. And, you know, I was always kind of picked last because I was never good at any sports, but you would try to pick the best person for your team, right? The strongest person who would fight for you and win the game. 
right? Sometimes that's falsely how we think of God. We want him on our team so that we win our battles. But that is not how we are to see God. Rather, we need to come on his team. We need to know our rank. As I said, the soldier in an army knows his rank. He knows who is above him. He knows who he takes orders from. We need to understand God's holy lordship, the lordship of Christ. Joshua needed to understand this. Though he was a commander in a sense, there was a commander of commanders, the commander of the host of Yahweh. I like how Dale Ralph Davis puts this. He says, sometimes we need to see that Yahweh is not so much partisan as sovereign. Not so much partisan as sovereign. He's not just coming onto our team or our party. He is sovereign Lord, and we must submit to his authority and his plans. God is not picking sides. Rather, we need to choose whether we are on his side. And this is a constant duty for us to examine whether we are doing God's work, God's way, under God's authority. To ask the question, who's really in command here? And this is something we can ask in every single area of life. This should bleed into everything that we do. We're to live quorum Deo, right, as our church motto is, in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. This applies to many areas of life then. The church's mission, like we spoke of several weeks ago, the Great Commission. Jesus has given us this mission as the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he says, go, and he tells us what we should do where we should go, the way we should do it. And he pledges his own presence to us as we go. So often we want to mold the mission of the church into our own ideas of what will be effective. But we need to come under Jesus' lordship and follow his way. We do know, though, that as we come under his lordship, he is there sword drawn, ready to fight for us. This applies to leadership, especially. Those who would be in authority need to be under authority. If you want to give direction, you need to be able to take direction. Any position of authority. Maybe you're a leader here in the church, elder or deacon. We need to constantly remember we are under Christ. We're under shepherds or under servants. He is the great and chief shepherd. He is the great servant of the Lord par excellence. We come under him. We seek to do things in his way, according to his word. Maybe you manage a business. You also need to remember you are under the Lord Jesus Christ, your master who is in heaven. And so you're to treat employees with fairness according to God's word. Colossians 4.1. And of course, we would pray for our governing leaders that they would also fall under Christ's command. As Romans 13.4 says, they are servants of God for our good. That's the way we're to view authority, is to be under the authority of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're in a marriage or your parents. Marriage and parenting fall apart very quickly. If we believe that we are in total control, if we are the chief officer in command, well, that just leads to a lot of brokenness and heartbreak and controlling and manipulative behavior. Rather, parents are to bring their children up in the instruction and discipline, not of themselves, but of the Lord. Right? Husbands are to love their wives like Christ loves the church. And wives are to love their husbands and submit to them. And we can only do this when we have first seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his proper place, his exalted position, and come under him. This affects all of our decisions and responses in life, really. How we look at where we go, what we decide to do how we look at, how we respond to the trials and circumstances of life. There is a famous poem 
from the Victorian era by a man named William Ernest Henley. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Invictus, which is Latin for unconquerable. Now listen to this poem for a moment and just think whether it reflects a Christian attitude or not. He says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The Christian cannot say that. The Christian finds that repulsive. We are not the masters of our fate or the captains of our soul. Rather, we have one captain, one commander of all the Lord's host. Jesus Christ is our head, our shepherd, our leader, and our defender. We are not the masters of our fate. Rather, he decides, he chooses, he is the only sovereign. Rather, we must come under his lordship and recognize him as the captain of our souls. I would submit that that attitude of unconquerableness, that stoicism that you're just going to follow your way no matter what happens, leads to no hope and no comfort at all. Who do you have to look to but your own self, your own weak and dying self? Actually, even as the poet was writing that, he wrote to a friend that he was afraid of death. He was going through... A terrible time, almost on his deathbed, he was afraid. Well, when we come under the lordship of Jesus Christ, we can entrust everything to him and actually not be afraid because we do have an almighty king above us who fights for us. See, this affects every area of life. Every day, every hour, really, we're to ask who's really in command. I'm not in command but Jesus, my Lord, is. So this gives us the greatest comfort. As we come under the direction of our good general, we know we have the full backing of the army of heaven and earth. As we come under Christ and follow his command, we know we have all of heaven's host, even on our side. But we must understand this. God is sovereign. God is independent. We are not Lord, he is. Now we see Joshua responding rightly to the Lord of Lords, to this commander of commanders. And so we, we want to look now at the commander's servant. How do we approach God in this way? How do we really get our hearts even in the right frame that we would submit to Jesus Christ's ultimate lordship? Joshua here shows us the way. I want to point out three things in the way that Joshua approaches Christ and that we also may approach Christ in this way. First of all, he worships. You see this, Joshua in verse 14, fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? He fell on his face. He worshiped. Implied here is that Joshua saw something of the glory and greatness of the commander. He saw the worthiness of Christ. He saw that Christ was great and he was under Christ. And so he fell on his face in this posture of complete submission to the commander of commanders. He saw the greatness of Christ and friends. Have you also seen the greatness and worthiness of Jesus Christ? Have you seen his infinite value 
As Jesus says in his parable, is he the, the, great, the pearl of great price to you? Is he that treasure hidden in the field that you would sell everything to purchase that field and have him forever? Is he to you, like, like Paul said, knowing him, all else is lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. This is the only way that we will bow to him. If we've seen Jesus Christ in all his worthiness as creator, as sovereign Lord, as redeemer, as savior, as mediator between God and man. As our great shepherd, have you seen Jesus Christ? Have you begun to worship him in your heart? Have you fallen before him in worship? Joshua responds in worship to Jesus Christ. This often happens throughout the Old Testament when people see God, his holiness, his greatness. They fall before him. Have you ever fallen on your face before the Lord Jesus Christ? In the privacy of your own room, reading his word, thinking upon him, have you fallen before him? This is common among saints in scripture. Why should it not be common among us? Worship is a response to the worthiness of Jesus Christ. It's a bowing of the heart and indeed the whole life to offer back up to God what he deserves because he is great. When people see a great scene in nature, they have to stop and admire it. We saw this, we were in Jasper. We stopped at the side of the road because everyone was stopped there. What were they looking at? Well, they saw a mother bear and her two cubs climbing a tree. They had to stop and admire this great creature. Well, how much more the creator of all things, our holy Lord of lords, do we stop? Do we look at him? Do we admire him? This is how we're to get our hearts right before him, to fall on our face and to worship him. We're to see Christ's worthiness and come before him, hearts bowed, praising his name. Now we see another thing Joshua does as he goes on here. He seeks God's word with a posture of su submission, an attitude of submission. He seeks God's word. Look at his question there. His first question to this commander after he worships him is this. What does my Lord say to his servant? And that word Lord there, I really think ought to be capitalized. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself Joshua is talking to. That is Adonai, Lord. What does my Lord say to his servant. That's really the question we're to ask God every day. That's the question through which we filter everything that we do and say and think. What does my Lord say to his servant? We're to recognize again, Jesus is Lord. And notice how Joshua doesn't just call him Lord. What does the Lord say to his servant? He says, what does my Lord say? to his servant. This is a relationship to the Lord, not just, not just of submission, but also of love and relationship. Can you say that to God? My Lord, my Lord, my God, my Savior. This is what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He recognized the personal relationship he had with the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus was his Lord who gave his life for him. Is Jesus your Lord, your Christ, your Savior? And is he really Lord? You know, those, those apostles called themselves continually doulos Christu, slaves of Christ. That's how we're to see ourselves. This one has died for us, for our sake. 
And we are in love compelled to live for him, him alone, not ourselves. We're slaves of Jesus Christ. And we're to seek his word as Joshua does here. What does my Lord say? What is my Lord speaking to me right now? And I'm not telling you to go and seek new words from God to daily get before God and say, say something to me, God. Say something new. I want to know what to do in this specific circumstance. Rather, I'm saying you come to the Lord in his already revealed word and you say, what does my Lord say to his servant? We must be steeped in the word of God. If you're going to go and seek new words from God, I would say, why don't you learn every word here first? Well, that's a task that's going to take more than any of our lifetime, isn't it? We ought to go to God in his written word, which is completely sufficient for all our ministry and life, and seek Christ's will in it. It's said that George Whitfield would always read his Bible on his knees and he would prop it up on a chair above him as a posture of submission, recognizing that he was under God's word. This is how we're to come to the Lord, worshiping him, falling before him. We seek his word. What do you say to your servant? Thirdly, we're to approach Christ as the Holy One. It says here, God's immediate word to him was this, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We see his immediate obedience to this command. And again, this is the same kind of scene we saw in Exodus chapter 3 where God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses turned aside. God said to him, take the sandals off your feet, for this is holy ground. Where God stands is holy, because he is holy, and we're to remove all uncleanness from us. Joshua takes his sandals off as a common signal of reverence toward majesty, but I also think there's something to this. Your shoes, your sandals are what gets dirty as you're walking around. And Joshua had to take those dirty sandals off to approach a holy God. See, this is the God who can bear no uncleanness in his presence. This is the God who revealed himself to Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah saw his majesty there, his transcendence and his purity. And he fell on his face and he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. That is how we are to come to God, even to Jesus Christ, falling before him, we must see our uncleanness, our sinfulness before a holy, holy, holy God. We must remove our sandals. We must come to him really asking for his cleansing, what only he can do. God there in Isaiah 6 sent an angel from the burning altar and he touched Isaiah's lips with it and he says, look, your sins are atoned for. It's only then through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, of God himself coming down to earth, living a righteous life in our place, dying on our behalf to forgive us of our sins and being raised for our justification and ascended to heaven as our great high priest who intercedes for us that we can come to this holy God, remove our sandals, come before him and submit to him as the commander of commanders. Friends, you must see the holiness of God. You must worship him. You must come and seek his word and so fall under his lordship in every area of life. Who is really in command here? Not us, 
but this holy Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if you are one of his servants, if you've seen his holy lordship, then be encouraged because Christ, your Lord, is with you, ready to go before you and fight, sword drawn. He goes out before his people. But you must recognize daily his sovereignty. Come under his agenda. Worship him. Listen to his voice and recognize him as holy. Friend, if you're not a part of Christ's army today, and you also can come to him. If you are humbled, you recognize your sinfulness before this holy God, and you come to Jesus Christ, clinging to nothing but the cross work of Jesus, and trusting in that for your salvation, you can also know God as your Lord and be a part of his army. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for this passage, God, and we pray that it would sink down deep into us, Lord, that it would become part of the way we think daily, Lord, that we would come before you in all of life, Lord, as, as Lord, you say, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you? And there will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, and you'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Lord, but we come to you, we ask that you'd cleanse us, you'd help us, Lord, to follow you. We would deny ourselves, we would live under your holy lordship all the days of our life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to the time of communion, I'll just remind you how we participate in this at our church. Um, during this next song we play, people will start coming up and grab the elements and then go back to their seats where we will partake together. I'll also remind you that this ordinance of communion is given to believers in Jesus Christ. It's not for those who are not yet believing in Jesus, not yet repenting of their sins. It's not for the ignorant who don't know the gospel. It's not, it's also not for hypocrites. Those who walk in unrepentant sin, no intention of really submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But it is for repentant, believing sinners who are still sinners too, and yet saints through the work of Jesus Christ. So come now during this song, think upon Jesus Christ, his love for you, how he's died for you, and we'll partake in this together. Please stand with me. If you'd like to follow in a hymn book, we'll be singing hymn 343.
this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love around the table of the king the blood that cleanses every state of sin shed for you drink and remember he drained us cup that all be entering to receive the life of God so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the King. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving for the bread. Lord, we thank you for the bread of life, Lord, the bread from heaven, Lord, that we eat of when we believe in you, Lord. When we come to you in faith, Lord, you continue nourishing us, Lord, with this fact that you have died for us. Lord, you've given us assurance of eternal life because of your perfect work your perfect once for all sacrifice and so we thank you lord we don't come to this as a ritual but as a remembrance not as gaining some special miraculous grace from it that we have not already received but a reminder of the grace that you've already given at the cross and Lord, that you continue to give as we trust in you. Lord, we thank you for your great and perfect sacrifice and for this bread that we can partake together as a whole body of believers communing together with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Take and eat it. Let's give thanks also for the cup. Lord, we thank you for the cup as well, this emblem of your blood. Lord, the fountain of our cleansing. Lord, the, the only way of our atonement. Lord, as even in the Old Testament, many animals were sacrificed, bled out, slain as an emblem of this that was to come, Lord, because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. But your blood, your precious blood of infinite value as the only begotten Son, precious, sinless, unstained, innocent, separated from sinners, Lord, we thank you for this blood that actually does take away all of our sins and throws them into the depths of the sea and removes them as far from us as east is to west. 
Lord, so we thank you that we can stand forgiven and loved and accepted, welcomed by you, adopted as sons and daughters through this blood. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So let's sing again together the last verse of the communion hymn. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond. of Christ as his body here on earth as we share in his suffering we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the king well, the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen let's fellowship together <laughs>